Now, last week, with the help of Breitbart.com, we showed you rare footage of President Obama during his law school years hugging his controversial Harvard professor, Derek Bell. And in those 1991 remarks, he calls on all of us to open up our hearts and minds to the words of Professor Derek Bell. So that is exactly what we're going to continue to do. Listen to this. I see Louis Farrakhan as a great hero for the people. I don't agree with everything he says and some of his tactics, but, but hell, I don't agree with everything anybody. Back to the Rodney King question. Given all of these variables, can we all get along? I'm not sure we can get along. I think that we are in a very dire uh, time, uh, that the parallels with the late 1900s are, are very, very real. Why do you do it? And she said, Derek, I'm an old lady. I live to harass white folks. She saw her life as given in trouble, being on the case all the time. And uh, I've, I've accepted that as my motto. I live to harass white folks. And tonight we continue to amass more of the radical statements that he's made. Now, according to Commentary Magazine, in a 1994 interview published in the New York Observer, Bell embasted Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. for writing a New York Times op-ed condemning African-American anti-Semitism. Now, Professor Bell is quoted as saying, quote, I was furious. Even if everything he said was true, it was inexcusable not to mention what might have motivated blacks to feel this way and fail to talk about about the Jewish neoconservative racists who are undermining blacks in every way they can. Now, Bell went on to call anti-Semitism, quote, awful, but I'm not sure how exactly that meshes with the quote you just heard. Joining me now with reaction, Sirius XM host David Webb is back, and from the New York Civil Rights Coalition, Michael My Myers is here. Let's see. Um, I've accepted this as my motto, I live to harass whites. Let Louis Farrakhan is a great hero of the people. He talked about white boys getting tenure at Harvard, uh, this comment that that he's referring to right. here. So how we how do we how do we define this? Well, first thing, and I want I want America to really give us a really key thirty seconds here, Sean. It's not about the hug; it's about the narrative that comes from him. And I want to go down point by point, quick thirty seconds. It's important. Bell's influence is felt today in culture because he's created racial division. He's taught politicians, teachers, lawyers, social workers. That's a big effect. He's not Reverend Wright. He's worse because he's had that wider influence of influencing people who take it and go on. And like Alinsky, he wants to take down the system with discontent. He didn't just embrace him. Obama didn't just embrace Bell. He taught him at the University of Chicago. It was important. And I want to apply simple logic. You use their logic. Liberal psychologists talk about your formative years that influence you, the people that influence you, that make you the man who you are. They use this in the criminal justice system in the approach. Why won't they apply this to President Barack Obama? It's not Why won't they apply that logic? But what's important about what I just said, and I put, put a lot of time into just those statements, because I want America to follow that narrative of analyzing the associations, as you want them to do, of really taking a look at what forms a man's opinion. It's funny, because some say, oh, it's just a hug between a professor. Who is he hugging? And then you look at the bigger picture of the president's friends, the... You know, do you think do you think these comments are racist? The do you think those comments are racist? Do you think that's anti-Semitic? Of course. By uh, the professor. Yeah, of so course. So he's hugging a racist and anti-Semite? Well, Is that a look, fair statement? The anthem of the civil rights movement has always been, which side are you on? You choose sides. You either choose for racial reconciliation or you choose racial polarization. You choose racial harmony or you choose racial lunacy and deification of skin color. The friends and the allies and the mentors of Barack Obama chose racial idiocy. They chose deification of skin color. They chose Farrah Khan to, to emulate, to advocate for, to, rep, to, to say that Farrah Khan, the apostle of anti-Semitism and black racism, is supposedly and somehow the spokesperson in, of, of African Americans. He's not. So anytime you have the empowerment of black ideology, you have, you have I think, the endorsement of racism. Now, one more, one more, one more point, and that is that that Obama's sin is the sin of not just hugging, it's the sin of omission. Because he's the intellectual, and the intellectual must, the scholarship of the intellectual must refute, refute 
racial idiocy. You I, cannot be silent. Because we're, you know, for the most transparent administration, we don't know a lot about his past. Right. And then we look at his as he grew older, and it was the Alinsky Acorn community organizing model. It was Reverend Wright as he began his career in the political career in Bill Ayers' homes. Mm -hmm. So this started here, and it's another piece of the puzzle because we didn't learn about a lot about him before he became president. Here's here's. I don't. I said when we aired this, this wasn't the smoking gun. I think his three years and a half years as president, <laughs> that record should be the smoking gun because it's so bad. Right. But the question is, what does this tell Americans? What should they learn from this? And Ayers, Dorn, Wright, Flager, Acorn, Alinsky, and and all straight on down. What do we? What, what does this tell us about him? Sean, I want Americans to apply their own common sense to this. We look at each other. We get to know each other. We grow up. We recognize our influences. We go forward. We must apply that simple common sense to President Obama. He was taught a narrative, and you use the right word, an ideology. He was not taught to be open to other ideas, to look for evolving ideas, to look for an evolution of a human being. He was taught a narrative in Harvard at 29 uh, inches and, and at now, 50 does question. the same thing. Does his governing confirm that he stuck to the rigid ideology yes, of because, the controversial because, figures in his life? Yes, because he invites the racial uh, ideolo ideologues to the White House all the time, and I can name names. But the one point I have to make is that in choosing sides, which side are you on, you know, I hate this critical race theory because it says that white Americans who struggled for civil rights were somehow doing it for self-interest. That is a slur and a smear on, yeah. on the reg legacy and the memory memory of Andrew Goodman and, and Cheney Goodman and Schroener uh, and, and uh, the legacy in terms of Mississippi, who died for civil rights, not because of self-interest. It's a smear on Viola Louise, Louiso, who died, was shot and killed in the, in, the, in, the, in the support and struggle for civil rights for blacks. This kind of racial rhetoric, that's why I can say again, must be refuted by the President of the United States, and he identifies with demagogues. Nice word. Simple fact is the majority of America is white. So the majority of people who fought for civil rights and helped get this through in the 60s were white people. We're not separated by color. We're brought together by our common uh, intersections, what we agree on. And that's great about this you know, culture. The interesting fact on that is that the, Lyndon Johnson for the 64 Civil Rights Act and then the 65 Voting Rights Act needed the Republicans. People mm -hmm. like Al Gore's father, right. nowhere right. to be found. Democrats abandoned. Wouldn't have happened without the Republican Party. Just interesting fact. Guys, the party of Lincoln. It, that's, that's correct, sir. <laughs> Freedom and opportunity in America. I that's don't have to be Newt Gingrich to be a historian. All right. And coming up, presidential hopeful.